It's my pleasure today to talk about lupus and cannabis. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about lupus patient perspectives. In a survey of 77 people with individuals with lupus, about a third had used herbal therapies to relieve symptoms, including turmeric, but also marijuana, green tea, reported as most beneficial. Other surveys have showed that patients with lupus have interest in and desire information on the use of medical cannabis. However, I'm going to put a caveat in here. Despite the high interest, we're going to need more preclinical and clinical research for medicinal cannabis in lupus before we can make really specific further recommendations. Cannabis is historically an old medicine. The earliest written references go back to 1500 BC in the Chinese pharmacopoeia. We have in our bodies an endocannabinoid system, an internal signaling system found throughout the animal kingdom that influences multiple metabolic pathways that provide homeostasis or balance within our body. There are two endogenous cannabinoids, anandamide 2-AG. It's important to understand that these endogenous or internal cannabinoids in our bodies are involved in a multitude of metabolic processes, which can explain to us a wide range of applications that have been observed. Endocannabinoids are present in breast milk. Runner's high, it might be due to endocannabinoids, not to endorphins. Even a proposed mechanism of action for acetaminophen or Tylenol is indirect activation of a cannabis or cannabinoid receptor, CB1. How does it work? Well, the major action are between the synaptic connections between neurons. On this slide, you can see a presynaptic or sending neuron, which is sending neurotransmitters to a postsynaptic or receiving neurons. How does it send the message? It sends neurotransmitters. However, endocannabinoids, as well as cannabinoids in plants or the ones that are synthesized, act on a feedback loop through a cannabinoid receptor on the sending neuron to slow down, shut down the neurotransmitter release. So it's a neuromodulator. There are two receptors for cannabinoids in the body. CB1, predominantly in the central nervous system, but also nerve cells. CB2, in immune cells in multiple areas of the body. Now here you can see another picture of the human endocannabinoid system, reminding you about its multiple effects on mood, memory, metabolism, stress, appetite, immune function, pain, and sleep. We recognize in plants two major players, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, CBD, cannabidiol, or CBD. THC, but can bind to the CB1 receptor. CBD does not directly fit either receptors, but has powerful indirect effects. But there are also other compounds, like cannabinol, CBN, as well as terpenes. What are the major delivery systems? Well, the ones I use in practice are predominantly edibles, such as brownies and gummies, particularly for sleep, where the absorption is going to be slow over time, tincture or oils. Uh, in the past, people had used a sublingual spray. It's not prohibited. Some patients have used smoking and vaping. I tend to discourage that since the, since the current COVID pandemic since I want to keep our lungs in tip shop shape. There are some efforts to try to do transdermal. There are teas. And I want to add this, that this past weekend, I had a CBD mocktail at a meeting with no alcohol, but just CBD content as well, served as a drink. Here's an example of three FDA approved medications. Uh, on the right, Sativex, used in muscle spasm and MS. Epidolex, used in seizures, a CBD type drug. Marinol, a THC type used for used for nausea uh, in patients with chemotherapy, for example. Potential uses of cannabis and lupus. Again, potential underlying pain. But as I'll mention, most studies neuropathic pain, nausea, muscle spasm. We'd like to find out about immune modulation, but I really don't have the data at this point. There's a potential role of CBD in treating autoimmune conditions such as lupus. There has been support for immunosuppressive properties. So it could be interesting. It could be also, it's somewhat anti-inflammatory. It can improve pain, physical function, sleep quality among people with arthritis. 
One could imagine since there's excessive immune and inflammatory responses are part of the tissue damage and symptoms in lupus that it could help, but the research is still in its early stages. Now let's look at, at how uh, efficacious cannabinoids are for chronic pain. Probably the most common use of cannabinoids. The mass majority of the studies have used THC alone, THC plus CBD or NAB alone. Very few studies of cannabis flowers and extracts, which obviously vary a great deal and are not necessarily standardized. There have been some negative studies of CBD and OA and low back pain. Adverse effects versus placebo, probably an increased risk of any or any odds ratio of three serious 1.4 odds ratio withdrawal due to adverse event about a threefold. You need to t about if number needed to harm, which means how many pay, how many individuals would have to take it to get dizzy, five, to be somewhat sedated, probably more common, five, confusion, 15, dissociation, number needed to harm, 20. If you're going to compare cannabinoids to other drugs, I thought this slide might be helpful. If you talk about reduction in pain, pain versus placebo, a greater than 30% reduction in pain, you would need to tr treat 11 people to definitely find patients that, or individuals that had a 30% reduction of pain. With pregabalin for diabetic neuropathy, 600 versus placebo, greater than 50% reduction, you need, would need, to treat, need to treat about eight. Or with duloxetine, 60 milligrams versus placebo, again for diabetic neuropathy, 50% reduction in pain, about five. Now, when we talk about efficacy, and we've always got to talk about concern, safety, cautions. Well, there are some contraindications. Certainly abuse, a use disorder, uh, individuals with certain psychiatric conditions, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, suicidality, and use prior to full de neurodevelopment means uh, our, our children who have not yet fully neurodeveloped. Cautions, again, in patients with PTSD, depression, who've had other substance use disorders, high cardiovascular, cerebrovascular risk, and certainly chronic bronchitis if one is smoking or vaping. Drug-drug interactions. Knowledge is limited by the difficulty of studying with cannabis in humans. A lot of regulations, a need for some standardized uh, extracts that can be used by investigators. They're metabolized in the liver, potential drug-to-drug -drug interactions in individual rheumatic disease, including increasing levels of tofacitinib, gabapentin, and antidepressants. In patients with comorbid heart disease or seizure disorders, could lower plasma concentrations of clopidogrel or some anti-seizure meds. And if they're taken together, they might have synergistic effect. There is some suggestion in, in some studies that it might lower the opioid dose needed to achieve pain intolerance, although not analgesia. Now, what about cannabis and lupus? Plasma levels of endogenous cannabinoids differ in people with SLE compared to people without. There is some interest in, use, in, in trying a clinical trial. I'm aware of one phase three clinical trial now for several years using a potential new drug made from a synthetic cannabinoid. It's ongoing, no results posted. There was one study in a mouse model of SLE which accelerated disease progression, not confirmed by further studies. There are barriers to acceptance of cannabinoid therapies. Physicians remain reluctant to use cannabinoids despite potential benefits. Part of that is due to a lack of physician training in appropriate use of cannabinoids. A recent survey of 258 American residents or fellows, almost 90% of the docs said they lack confidence in prescribing medical cannabis. So what do patients turn to? Well, in our some of the studies we've done, we're aware that people turn to staff in a marijuana dispensary, of which only 10% have received any training, or to friends or family, or to their children who might, they feel may have more experience than they do. So my summary is medical marijuana is not approved by the US FDA to treat lupus. There's a great deal we don't know about whether medical marijuana can help people with lupus. I want to emphasize that the current stance of the Lupus Foundation America 
is that more research is needed, but the foundation does support efforts to understand if marijuana is a viable treatment option to help manage or treat lupus. Thanks.